introduction today to today's uh, video recorded lecture. We will be uh, continuing with some of the points that I left off <clears throat> um, with on Friday. And um, we'll talk about 1 Thessalonians as well today. Okay. <clears throat> all right. How do I advance this stuff? There we go. We've talked all about this. I'm not going to review this again. Um, it's, you, you guys sounded to have a like, like you have a pretty good handle on um, some of this material that we talked about on Friday from reading your lecture responses. So, um, yeah, so basically today's lecture, our reading of 1 Thessalonians. Oh, great. So today's um, reading of 1 Thessalonians will be pretty squarely within the Paul within Judaism um, framework that we've been working on, primarily Thiessen and Petrie, um, and we will continue talking about Petrie today. Um, Petrie et al. Let's advance this slide here again. <clears throat> Talked about Galatians last class, and this is where we left off, right? So, um, the big thing that Petrie adds to um, our Paul within Judaism reading is that um, he adds it to Tison. Tison um, recognizes that the spirit uh, plays an important part in Paul's soteriology, right? Paul's theory of salvation. Fredrickson really doesn't talk about spirit very much. She'll touch on it, but... Um, Thiessen tends to think, you know, that Paul is uh, drawing on the Stoics um, because the Stoics, Stoic philosophy, was the, the, the most popular Greco-Roman philo philosophical school in Paul's time. <laughs> they, um, they conceived of um, God's spirit as permeating the entire world. And um, I won't say more about the Stoics now, but um, Thiessen's argument is that Paul, um, you know, to to explain why this Holy Spirit is so central to Paul's soteriology, um, when it's uh, doesn't uh, arguably the Holy Spirit is not a big emphasis in mainstream Judaism in Paul's time. Um, he explains that well, he's He's drawing not on Judaism, but he's drawing on Greco-Roman philosophy, especially Stoic um, doctrine or teaching about spirit. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, we will see when we get to 1 Corinthians um, later in the week, I think on Friday, that Paul does draw on Stoicism, but it's not like he's he's sourcing the idea from Stoicism. It's really the idea comes from um, apocalyptic Judaism. And it's not a super mainstream idea uh, in, in Judaism at the time, but, um, you know, Paul is not exactly a super mainstream Jewish thinker, right? As we've seen, he breaks from um, sort of dominant ideas about how Gentiles become Jews um, that most uh, mainstream Jews would have believed at the time. He tends to side more with, on the one hand, apocalyptic Judaism, on the other hand, um, Hellenistic Judaism. Um, so we will talk about today um, Grant Petrie's idea. He argues that Paul is drawing on uh, apocalyptic Judaism and the way that apocalyptic Jews privileged certain prophecies in the Old Testament, <clears throat> particularly prophecies that center on covenant renewal. Okay, so we've looked a little bit at these texts already. I won't, um, you know, go over everything I talked about on Friday. Jeremiah 31, we see here is an older prophecy, and it basically says that to bring an end to the exile, God is going to transform every Israelite, every Jew, um, so that they know God's law, right? The law is going to be written into their hearts. 
and um, they no longer will need prophets because everybody basically becomes a prophet. Everybody knows what God's will is, and um, they will therefore stop sinning, they will change their ways, and the exile will come to an end. Then we saw how Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, um, is is um, expanding on that prophecy, right? But he believes um, that he has a more pessimistic view, right, of what um, Israel is really capable of. He doesn't think they can repent sincerely enough in order to merit God to transform their hearts, which is, you know, what Je Jeremiah basically implies. So Ezekiel instead says um, the only th thing that's going to motivate God to give them this gift of this Holy Spirit <clears throat> is um, because God wants to sanctify his name, so to speak, right? We talked about the sanctification of his name or pro profanation of his name, right? So his name has been profaned among the nations because of the exile, and he is going to transform Israel to become obedient to him, and therefore he can bring an end to the exile. And um, that way Israel, or, or the Jews at this point, because um, they start being called the Jews after the end of the exile, um, the Jews uh, will... Um, sanctify God's name in, in the sense that um, they're showing the world how great God is because God can justify people. Okay, So these prophecies really are about justification, right? Um, and um, Paul reads these prophecies as not the law justifying, although, you know, that's, that's debatable, right? It really does look like Jeremiah believes that it's the law that justifies um it's just that god is going to somehow place the law within their hearts right and ezekiel similarly right he, he's going to give the holy spirit to um these jews but the holy spirit you know it's 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 implied already in jeremiah because he's making basically everybody a prophet insofar as everybody knows god's will god's law in their hearts so it's not like Ezekiel probably believed that the Holy Spirit was something separate than the law, but <clears throat> um, God giving the gift of his spirit would enable all Jews to become um, like prophets um, that knew the law. In any case, Paul reads these prophecies, it appears, as kind of distinct from the law. Okay. Um, and... Um, so we'll see as we go through, um, I'll, I'll go through a few texts here that show um, the way Paul talks about the Spirit and about um, how he talks about the law, that he really, he really interprets these passages in a way that kind of goes against the grain of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Um, he's saying that he wants to make, make these texts say that the law does not justify <laughs> It, it only kind of um, uh, is a precursor to the spirit and the spirit when God gives the spirit to um, Israel or people, the spirit will justify them and make them obedient to God in a way that the law was incapable of doing. Okay, so as I said, um, you know, last class on Friday, uh, we really want to um, emphasize that Ezekiel envisions his gift of um, the Holy Spirit of God <clears throat> as an unmerited gift, right? Because um, God is giving Israel his spirit um, at a time when they don't deserve it, right? Um, they don't, they, they don't have, uh, you can call this like a negative moral anthropology. They don't have the power within them, um, in their souls to repent sincerely enough, um, that, that, that would make them, um, change for the better. Right. Um, so 
Ezekiel believes that God, um, the, the, the people of Israel will only truly repent after God puts his spirit in them. Because like once they have his spirit within them, then they realize, oh, that's what God's will is. That's what's truly good. That's what's truly holy. Um, and that is what's truly sinful. <laughs> and they realize, that's when they realize, the, you know, how badly they've sinned against God, how much they've fallen short of, you know, God's ideals. And that's when they feel the moral compunction, right? The, the grief, the remorse, um, feeling bad about what they've done. So in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 31, it's after these verses that are on your slide here. He says, um, you know, after this transformation, then uh, Ezekiel says, then you shall remember your evil ways and your dealings that were not good. And you shall loathe yourselves for your iniquities and your abominable deeds. Right. So repentance only occurs not prior to the gift of the Holy Spirit, but after the gift of the Holy Spirit is given because uh, it's an unmerited gift. Right. Um, OK. Uh, probably. I'll belabor that point. Um, hopefully that's clear enough. So this is going to explain, I think, why Paul can see Gentiles as the recipients of the Holy Spirit, right? This is um, what I briefly mentioned at the end of Friday's class. Because Ezekiel 36 and Jeremiah 30, 31 are directed towards Israel, right? Or the Jews, the people of God. This is... These are prophecies that the Jews will be transformed to become finally obedient to God in this sort of stable, consistent way that they were not capable of um, before. But Paul applies these prophecies to the Gentiles. Um, and um, I would argue that the reason why he thinks that these prophecies are applicable to the Gentiles is because of the logic, right? This logic that if the Jews are only saved by an unmerited gift of the Holy Spirit, that makes them justified, then why not the Gentiles too, right? If the problem is the depths of Gentile sin, that's why he thinks that Gentiles can't be circumcised because circumcision would just be cosmetic surgery, right? As Thiessen puts it. Um, so the only thing that can transform them is this, uh, as we called it, like um, a infusion, right? A, a physical infusion of the spirit of Christ or the spirit of God, the spirit that God, uh, Christ gets from God <clears throat> um, into the Gentiles. And it transforms those who do not deserve um, righteousness. They, they, they haven't done anything to merit it, but it transforms them into righteous persons. Um, people that have the, the faith of Christ, the trustingness of Christ in God. And they will live, therefore, uh, with love and justice and respect for one another in their local communities. So Paul, <clears throat> and we'll see this when we get to 1 Thessalonians. Paul will often imply that the Gentiles' behavior is proof that they have the Holy Spirit, okay? Because, like, how do you prove, right, that if you're a Gentile and Paul says, yes, you've received the Holy Spirit, how do you prove that? You don't, you're not circumcised, you're not keeping kosher laws, right? Um, you're not washing, you're not keeping Sabbath. So how do you show the other Jews that you truly have the Spirit of God, which obviously it's invisible, right? So Paul will um, constantly say to the Gentiles, you know, I know you want those physical external markers that you belong um, to, to the people of God, but, you know, um, you, you, shouldn't you shouldn't have them because those are kind of false. They give you a false sense of security, right? Like, that you, you, can, you think that you can rely on um, these markers to say, okay, I'm fully saved. Because what Paul wants to say is, <clears throat> you should have a sense of certainty that you have received the spirit of Christ, but 
really to have the spirit of Christ is to be constantly sort of striving for justice and, and, and justification anyway, righteousness. Um, it's it would be contrary to having the spirit of Christ to think that, um, okay, I you know I, I keep the the Sabbath, I um, I uh, am circumcised and I'm good, right? Because obviously the whole life of Jesus, and we'll see this maybe more in the go Gospels when we get there. The whole life of Jesus was precisely a reform of Judaism, right? It was a renewal movement of Judaism. So he, obviously, whatever that means, it means that he is trying to uh, transform Judaism um, according to his opinion of what Judaism should be. So to to just say, okay, I you know, if I have the external markers of mainstream Judaism, I'm saved. It's obviously going to go contrary to Jesus's own intention, right? So Paul is trying to encourage these Gentiles not to rely on these markers, but to trust that they have the spirit and to be motivated by that trust, right? <laughs> that you really do have Christ's spirit within you. It really is transformative. It has the power to, to transform you, to make you into what Paul will often call a new creation um, because of God created the world through Jesus, which is something we'll get to later. Um, and, and and you've received Jesus. You are a new creation. You're a be the beginning of a re the renewal of God's creation. So one passage, I don't have it here on the slide, but I'm just going to read it for you. This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Okay, this is an important text. So, you know, um, you might want to look at the lecture notes um, for this under this slide when I um, put it on Sakai um, and look at this text um, because it's it's a good it's a good example of um, where Paul will use the language of Jeremiah 31 to describe um, the behavior of his Gentile believers as proof that they have the spirit. Okay. So he says, 2 Corinthians 3, um, verses 1 through 3, Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Surely we do not need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you, to you, or from you, do we? <coughs> you yourselves are our letter written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter of Christ prepared by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. So obviously you, you should have heard the resonance with Jeremiah 31, right? I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. Um, and uh, also the resonance with Ezekiel, right? Because he talks about how you are a letter of Christ prepared by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. You know, so the idea of spirit um, being put in you is um, from Ezekiel 36. And note there's a strong contrast there, right? Um, between the law that was written on tablets of stone, that's the, you know, the, the tablets uh, the, um, of the law that were given to Moses on Mount Sinai. He says, not written with, the, um, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts, right? So he's contrasting law and spirit there. Um, right. But that passage, um, one, it shows you that Paul, <laughs> 2 Corinthians was the second letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Paul is using um, explicitly sort of echoing, right, or alluding to Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36. And we'll see other allusions to um, those prophecies, um, even in 1 Thessalonians um, that we'll look at in a second. Um, but it shows you kind of how Paul has these texts in his mind when he's um, when he's thinking about what it means for Gentiles um, and Jews um, to receive Christ's spirit. Um, and um, he believes that receiving the spirit through Christ fulfills the prophecies that Jeremiah and Ezekiel made about the future right about how god would transform them in the future <clears throat> all right next slide 
So these are some texts that relate to um, wh where Paul talks about the Holy Spirit. Um, he always talks about the Spirit as an unmerited gift. Um, so in the first passage, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, we see that pretty clearly. Uh, we'll look at Romans some more, um, I believe, n next week. But um, here we'll just get a taste of it. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. A grace, the word grace in Gre Greek is charis, and it's just the word for gift. Right? The English translations of the Bible tend to translate it as grace because grace sounds more churchy. Um, and, uh, you know, Christians know, okay, grace, you know, they, 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 it, it's a, it's a very common word in Christian theology. So if, if you've been, you know, if you go to church and things like that, you know, you've gone to Sunday school, you have some sense of what grace means. That's why the translators are using the word grace, but it's just gift in, in the, in the Greek. And it, it helps to think about it as gift, I think, because, um, a gift is given to somebody. And with the expectation that, you know, there's going to be a gratitude, right? And that gratitude is going to motivate some kind of behavior in, in exchange, right? Whether you give a gift back or you are grateful and you are loyal to that person, the, all those connotations are, are there, right? Um, when Paul conceives of um, what Jesus has done for you as a gift, okay? So, um through whom we have obtained access to this grace, this gift in which we stand. <clears throat> so he's emphasizing that this being righteous through Jesus, it's a gift. It's not what you know you sort of did um, to earn this status. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and ca character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Okay. Um, so what Paul is emphasizing here, right, is that it's an unmerited gift, right? It, Christ dies for those people who are sin sinners um, in order to make them righteous, in order to transform them. Um, why does he say that? Because he thinks that Gentiles are deeply sinful, right? And that um, he's reading Ezekiel 36 as a prophecy that, um, you know, people will receive this spirit in an unmerited fashion. It's going to make them righteous. Um, and he sees Christ giving that spirit, right, to the Gentiles. And nothing, he thinks nothing else can justify them except for this kind of direct infusion of righteousness from Jesus's own kind of essence, right? Uh, and then we have <clears throat> just a few lines down in Romans 5, 17. If because of the one man's trespass, he's talking about Adam um, in the Garden of Eden, death exercised dominion through that one because Adam's sin um, leads to death, he thinks. And um, all human beings... Um, basically inherit an inclination towards sin through Adam. Pro that's probably what he's thinking. And that's why there's death in the world, because um, the punishment of sin is death, right? Eventually, all people that are sinful will die. If you don't have sin, then there's no more death, okay? <laughs> that's how Paul thinks, okay? So if because of the one man's trespass, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of gift or grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So sin and death come through Adam. Uh, righteousness and life come through Jesus. So um, the spirit is understood as the spirit of Jesus, you notice here, right? Um, and it cancels out that inclination towards sin, original sin, that was inherited from Adam. It's possible that Paul is the first one to invent this original sin reading of Genesis, 
uh, Genesis chapters two and three, where, uh, where Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden, um, because it's quite likely that that the story originally did not, it, it, it didn't imply that all of Adam and Eve's descendants inherited an inclination towards sin and, de and death um, through their one act. Um, that's another story, though. We can't get into that here. But <clears throat> anyway, um, it's, it's possible that, um, at, at least in the Bible that we have, the, as far as I know, the first clear interpretation of that story is in um, Paul. And then we have... Um, okay. uh, let's see, a few um, lines down in Romans chapter 6, verse 3. We have some hints of that Pauline participation and participationism that we talked about. Do you not know that uh, all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So notice, Paul is saying that when Christians are baptized, you know, they're dunked in water, right? They're naked and they're dunked in water as a sign of um, kind of repentance and the belief is that the Holy Spirit would be given to you after you're baptized. So Paul is interpreting that ritual that all early Christians went through. He didn't invent this, right? But he is going to rethink what the, the ritual means in light of his theology of participationism, right? So he says, um, when you were baptized, you were baptized into Christ Jesus. You became, you know, because if you receive the Holy Spirit, then um, you're actually becoming part of Jesus Christ, right? You're receiving his spirit. You're becoming him. Um, so he, he sort of, he wants to suggest that, you know, what was Jesus then? If, if you're inheriting Jesus' spirit, what is the Jesus' essence? He summarizes it basically as Christ died. You know, um, he he was he died in full obedience to God, showing his faithfulness towards God. And um, he died for us. He died for um, humanity so that he could give his spirit to um, humanity. So that he could also show humanity what it meant to be fully obedient to God. OK, um, not to to uh, sort of. um, um uh, to 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 um, give up your life, to show your willingness to give up your your life, your self interest, everything that you have, um, because you recognize that all things come from God, and to die for God, right? <clears throat> As the sort of ultimate sign of um, the extreme of what faithfulness towards God means. So he's going to suggest that. Everybody that's baptized is baptized into Christ Jesus, and they're baptized into his death. And, and, and I'll continue with this verse. Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So everybody that's baptized, that receives the Spirit of Christ, is um, basically dies with Jesus to their self um, and in order to live towards God. Okay, So um, the next... Few, you know, the next passage that I quote here on this slide, a few more, a few lines down in Romans chapter six, verses 10 to 12, he makes that explicit that he, when he, when he says that we die and we live, um, it's, you die to sin and you live to God. So he says the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. So um, to have the spirit is to die to sin and live to God. It, but notice that um, this helps you understand that salvation by receiving the um, spirit of Christ, it's not automatic, right? It's not like, okay, you get baptized and you can assume, okay, now I'm Jesus, basically. Um, I have died to sin and I live to God. Great, you know, um, end of story. But while, you know, Ezekiel 36 and Jeremiah 31 may, may sound like, it, you know, that's what they're talking about. You know, one um, interpreter of those passages calls it like robo-righteousness, 
right? It's like, um, how is that just if you can just be transformed and made righteous? But clearly, Paul doesn't think that he uses that language, right? That, okay, you receive Jesus' spirit, and that's basically the key to salvation. But he clearly means that, okay, if you receive that spirit, you have to kind of cooperate with the spirit. You have to become what you already are, some, some people will say. Um, so salvation is not automatic, but you, um, you have to cooperate with the spirit, right? You must, he says, you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. Do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. I think the passage goes on and says, you know, but present your um, members, um, you know, your, your body um, to God as instruments of righteousness, right? So there's still work that needs to be done, right? Uh, salvation is through faith by receiving Christ's faithfulness. But if you receive that faithfulness, you will do good works. It's going to be work, right? Salvation does require work. It's not like this automatic thing, right? Um, <clears throat> so we'll see that when we get to 1 Thessalonians as well. But, um, uh, and this, this is, it's, it's consistent through Paul, right? He always conceives of the life of early Christians as, yes, you have been saved, but you still need to put in the work kind of thing. Um, and he'll talk about good works, right? So it's not like when he says salvation through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ apart from the works of the law, he's not saying, obviously, that um, you don't have to do good works. Um, he, 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 you know, he does. He explicitly says at the end of Romans that, you know, you have to do, you know, you, you have to not be an idolater and you have to do all of those laws that were in the second tablet of the Ten Commandments, right? Um, okay, so so Paul still needs to urge and exhort, right, the believers to live or walk by the spirit that is in them. So this is a way of saying, like, you believers have the intuitions and the feelings and the trust towards God, the right ones, but they have to decide and choose and act, right, on their own. They have to do that. They are still, still you know, they are in the spirit, but they're also still partly in the flesh. So the more they choose the good, the more they they choose to walk by the spirit, the stronger kind of the spirit rules in them. And, you know, the more that they live by those good intuitions, feelings and trust, trust towards God that Jesus has given them. Um, and, and the weaker the inclinations towards sin, self-interest, you know, the passions, you know, et cetera, um, the weaker the flesh gets within them. OK. That is Paul's anthropology, Paul's way of thinking about the human person, right, and, um, and, and ethics. Okay, so Romans chapter 7, we talked about, uh, I can't remember, this wasn't on Friday, I think it was on Wednesday or Monday of last week, but we talked about how Paul thinks in Hellenistic terms, how he kind of thinks about the self, you know, as like, two parts right like if you think of the soul as a sphere and the bottom half is kind of the biological impulses the passions you know the um, need for food and sex and sleep and you know etc um, and then the top is mind or reason right and you know either the mind can rule over the body or the body can rule over the mind right so and and um, just as the philosophers will often uh, kind of describe um, the the predicament of people who don't have strong enough reason um, as this conflict between the two spheres of their soul. Sometimes it's three parts, you know, you know there, there might be reason and then in the middle there's emotions and then on the bottom there's the passions or the biological um, drives. <laughs> Um, the animal drives of the of the human person. Um, but in any case, um, they will often depict it as a tension, right? Or a conflict between different parts of the soul. So here too, in Romans chapter seven, um, you know, he's talked about the way that everybody um, basically sins. And he ta he's talked about how um, 
the law was not good enough to um, justify people, but uh, God needed to send his spirit um, to transform the person, and you are transformed through the spirit of Christ. We just saw that in Romans 6. So in Romans 7, he, um, he has this kind of hypothetical person speaking. Um, it's not him. It's clearly not him. He'll use the, the first person, I, in this passage, but he it's clearly not him because Paul never speaks about himself as this kind of person as that's struggling, you know, to kind of be righteous. Paul is always very self-confident, you know, overly confident, boastful. But it, it's quite likely that he's he's thinking of a Judaizing Gentile here. Um, that's how, for example, Thiessen, Fredrickson, and others will read this passage. Um, not everybody reads it that way. Sometimes people will read this as like a, a, a Jew that feels like, you know, um, they, they can't, you know, they can't do the law properly. Um, so they are like lamenting their inability to do what they, they know is right. Um, that's possible. That's kind of how the Paul against Judaism would read this. Um, and it's it's possible that it could be both, that it could refer to a Judaizing Gentile or a Jew that's struggling to try to do the good. But uh, I'll just read this passage here. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Um, so you notice, right, he, he's kind of got that mind-body thing going on. It's a conflict. <laughs> in the mind, you know it's right. You delight in the law, but your body is, um, you know, operating according to another law, the law of the flesh, the law of sin, right? So this is a person that, for example, Ar Aristotle would describe as an acratic person, somebody who is not in control of themselves, Um is like an alcohol problem, you know, hormonal teenager. I mean, you know, um, so uh, we we all know what he's talking about, right? Where, you know, we um, want to do a certain thing and um, um, for various reasons, we feel like we don't have the power to um, do what we have decided is the right thing to do, right? Okay, um, so... This is just, you know, I, I include this just to illustrate that uh, the point that we made earlier that Paul sees the Judaizing Gentile as um, somebody who, you know, their body, uh, they might, they might in their mind have decided, okay, I want to be a Jew, right? I want to follow the law. But their body is inclined, habitually inclined to a different way of life, right? Um, and I think when he's thinking of this, he's thinking, you know, in the Roman Empire, prostitution is legal, um, even though a lot of Greco-Roman philosophers will say prostitution is not good, even though it's legal. Um, and so sexual ethics... Um, they also, you know, obviously um, Jews uh, have a strong um, uh, sexual ethics where they will condemn homoeroticism, um, same-sex um, sexual activity. Whereas Greco-Romans, um, that is not, you know, there's no strong condemnation in Greco-Roman culture for that. They have a, a totally different sexual ethics where um, some some same-sex acts are um, fine, other same-sex acts are bad. And we'll see that when we get to the queer, um, queer theory reading of Romans. Um, I think that's in a week or two. But um, yeah, it's, it's a different way of thinking. Um, but Paul, so Paul is thinking about those kind of things. He's also thinking that pagans are idolaters um, they don't worship the right God. Um, and they don't have, you know, they don't um, 
see the laws of their city as a religious um, requirement per se, right? Um, they are a, they're a civic, you know, um, obligation. You, you have to, you know, go by the laws. You can't steal people's things or, you know, commit adultery with other people. You know, there are laws against those kind of things generally, but um, they're not necessarily conceived of as a direct sin against your God kind of thing. Okay. So anyway, that's, that's why Paul thinks of the pagans as, you know, steeped in sin and they have a problem with self-control and this is a good passage that illustrates that okay so let's move on to the first letter to the thessalonians which was assigned for monday for today okay let me um switch over here to the second slideshow okay well that's the wrong there we go hopefully hopefully you're seeing the right screen here um <laughs> Some of this stuff we've already gone over here. So the first th letter to the Thessalonians, it's quite possibly, um, probably the first letter that we have in the New Testament anyway, that um, he wrote. And he was writing it to this community of Christians in Thessalonica. Uh, we have his map here. There's Thessalonica. You see this? Uh, hopefully you can see my cursor here. It's in... Um, this is Turkey here. This is sort of modern day Greece, right? And Thessalonica is right there. I'm not sure if it's in Greece or in Macedonia or what at today. Thessalonica. I think it's in Greece. Um, so he is writing to a community of early Christians there. The central themes in, in around 50 CE, um, this, this is a Gentile community. Yeah, all evidence um, shows that these are all ethnically Gentiles, non-Jewish, right? Um, probably, you know, generally um, what we would consider like Greek by ethnicity, right, um, um, persons. And they, um, a lot of them were probably God-fearers who, um, you know, heard Paul's teaching and um, decided to follow Christ um, and but they have all the anxieties, it seems like, that we've been talking about that God fears have, right? They worry, are you know, how can we Greeks be part of the Jewish people of the Jewish God, right? Um, and we don't have strong criticism criticisms of um a desire to be circumcised here. So it seems like they're they're past that point, right? Like Okay, they they they're on board with Paul's teaching. Um, they you know they're not you know asking to be circumcised, etc. <laughs> as far as I can remember, you know, but we'll see. We'll read through some of these passages in One Thessalonians. Um, and, but they still do seem to worry um, about you know whether they are really part of the chosen people of God. So Paul is. Um, trying to persuade them of that, right? He's trying to console them. He's trying to assuage their fears. He's trying to say, you know, you do have the Holy Spirit, you know. Um, people are talking about you and, you know, about how faithful you are towards God. And we'll see that emphasis again on behavior, you know, good behavior demonstrating as a demonstration or proof that you do have the Holy Spirit in this passage. Um, so, the other thing is that they're being persecuted by other by Jews in their um in Thessalonica probably, um. Uh, you know, possibly other um, Christians that think that you know Paul's Christians aren't doing right, right? That they should be circumcised, etc. Um, we saw that in Galatia, right? That um, Paul had to sort of persuade his Galatian um, believers, you know, don't worry about those guys. They want you to be circumcised because they want to make a good showing in the flesh, as he puts it, right? He, they, they want to show other Jews that, you know, you are, you know, proper Gentile converts. But, um, but anyway, so th there's going to be an issue with persecution here, and he is going to emphasize endurance and joy in persecution. So, one of the um, kind of 
proofs that you have the Holy Spirit um, in Paul's letters, you see it over and over, is that that you can have joy in the midst of persecution, right? It shows that you have something sort of supernatural within you, that you can overcome these um, kind of earthly, you know, human physical problems, right? Um, and um, and we'll see some sort of peculiar aspects about the Thessalonian community. It seems like, you know, one thing about the early Christians was that they were they really aspired to a radical egalitarianism, right? Um, meaning that they, like a lot of Jews, um, but early Christians maybe were more radical in this regard. Uh, well, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to say that actually. Um, they were maybe as radical as some of the most radical Jews. Okay, um, about this, but they believed that their community should be places of perfect justice. There's a lot of teaching in the Old Testament about economic justice. You know um, that God would judge Israel if they. Um, if if there are patterns of economic abuse of the vulnerable, the marginalized, the poor in their communities. So the prophets will often <clears throat> say if something bad happens in Israel, it's well, it's because, you know, the landlords are taking it out on, you know, their tenants or people are improperly treating their slaves and God is angry about that, right? So economic justice, socioeconomic justice is a, is a big thing among radical Jews and, and early Christians. So um, it's quite likely that in Thessalonica, you have some maybe wealthy people, maybe a few people that have houses. Um, and then there are other people who, you know, part of the early Christian communities was they, they met once a week, right? Like um, Christians nowadays. And um, it was the the, um, the 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 day of the Lord, you know. It was their version of the Sabbath, so to speak. And they would meet together. They would have a communal feast, right? The um, the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist. They would um, um, maybe read scriptures, as in synagogues. They might prophesy. They um, would, um, you know, celebrate by eating and drinking this communal um, feast that um, commemorated um, Christ's death for them. And uh, at, at these meals, um, the poorest members of the community and, you know, some of the, the poorest members in the community were probably very poor, right? Like beggars, people that didn't have jobs for, you know, whatever reason, um, and they were basically financially dependent probably on their benefit uh, benefactors in the community. Um, so there's going to be a theme in this um, letter um, of encouraging people to work, um, encouraging people not to be idle. Um, and also to live virtuous, quiet lives, right? Um, because... The early Christians were being, um, they could be brought before um, judges, um, Roman judges, um, for being Christian, and they could be executed. The Roman Empire at this point was not going out and persecuting Christians. Um, probably the first major persecution of Christians happens maybe in 64 CE. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit uh, more later, but um, I think particularly when we when we get to the letter to the Romans. So in Paul's time, um, <clears throat> Paul tends to be uh, his his sort of strategic message to early Christians is just keep your heads down. Don't get into trouble with Roman uh, magistrates because you could technically. Um, be killed by a Roman judge just because you're a Christian, because Christianity wasn't a legal, uh, it wasn't a legal recognized religion at this point, right? Judaism was, but there were lots of ways in which other Jews were, you know, they were like, we don't accept these other, you know, these Christ following Jews, you know, we don't believe that that's our Messiah. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're, um, 
they they have you know communities like like Paul's where you know these Gentile believers aren't even being circumcised, etc. So it's it's possible that um, other Jews um, could get Christians into trouble, and it could get them in trouble with Roman the Roman Empire. <laughs> Because, you know, Romans generally, I think a lot of Romans didn't like Jews. I mean, obviously, there are sympathizers, right? The God fearers. But there are lots of Romans that didn't like Jews because they didn't sacrifice to their gods. Um, but Jews, um, they, they, they had an official okay from the empire, right? They're an ancestral religion. They are this major, you know, sort of political, um, they have major political power in the um, the Near East. So Romans, you know, um, they, they've, um, you know, it's, it's a legal, it's a legal religion, legal culture. They've backed, um, they supported um, Jews against other ethnic communities that had issues with them in, in various ways, uh, but Christians didn't. So anyway, um, Paul will tend to, his attitude toward the Roman Empire tends to be somewhat uh, quietist, I guess. Um, I don't know if I'm using that word right. He's, he's trying to, um, he's trying to, you know, encourage people not to stir the boat, uh, rock the boat. Okay, let's just get into this letter. All right, so the letter opening, all um, Pauline letters, um, well, let's say all letters in the ancient world had typical features. So first you have the sender um, uh, identified. So here in the letter opening for First Thessalonians chapter 1, starting with verse 1 up to verse 10, uh, it starts with Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, right? Those are the authors of this letter because um, Paul would often co-write his letters with other people. Uh, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. So that's the addressee, right? The um, So first you would identify the sender, then the addressee, and then you would have some kind of greeting. Usually in a letter, it was high rain or high rain, which means like rejoice. Um, and here he has grace to you and peace, charis, um, charis and um, um, irene, humi, charis, humi, irene, or something like that. Um, so grace to you in peace. That's a, you know, fairly, fairly typical letter opening. Um, and then letters tend to be really short in the ancient world. Uh, and this is a long letter. So this is unusual, right? It's, this is basically like taking the letter form and turning it into literature almost, almost. Um, so the next thing you have after the greeting is a Thanksgiving statement. So I, you know, I'll write to Bob and I'll say, Paul, or I'm sorry, Brian, <laughs> Brian to Bob, um, you know, rejoice. Um, uh, I, I give thanks to the gods for your health, you know, and then I would, you know, go on to the body of my letter, right? The reason why I'm writing, um, you know, you still owe me 50 bucks. Okay. Um, in closing, you know, um, uh, uh you know, say hello to your wife for me. Um, goodbye. Farewell. Uh, that's a kind of a typical letter. But here, the Thanksgiving, right, becomes a, th a thesis statement. So it's, it's much longer. And it sounds the themes of the letter. Um, because Paul's letters are arguments, right? Um, they're generally, he's trying to persuade his um, letter recipients of something. Um, and it has to do with the circumstances in which that community is, you know, they're they're living at the time. And Paul wants to advise them regarding those circumstances. And he will often kind of do so theologically, drawing on his theory of salvation, his soteriology. So here he's, he goes on to say, we always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers constantly. Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so those are some central themes. You notice that you have faith, hope, and love. Those are kind of the three 
you know, um, kind of gifts of the Holy Spirit, you could say. Like the, the main characteristics of somebody that has Jesus' spirit is that you have faith, hope, and love, right? Trust towards God, um, hope towards God, towards the future, and love not only for God and Christ, but for all of um, those that have the spirit and, you know, hopefully um, all humanity. But it also says, besides faith, hope, and love, it says work, labor, steadfastness, right? So there again, you see that salvation isn't just through faith. It starts with faith, right? Um, having the faithfulness of Jesus in you is the, the kind of seed of salvation. But that seed needs to grow through work, right? Labor, steadfastness. Um. Okay, so, and, and notice it's in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's part of the participationist thing, right? You you are in Jesus, and um, Jesus is in you. You have Jesus' spirit, and you are in Christ Jesus. He'll often say that the believers are in Jesus, or in Christ, or in Christ Jesus. Um, because it's almost like he envisions Jesus, um, to be kind of like this microcosm, this new world, and believers are part of this new creation. Like it's like you know you're you're in the regular world, but that regular world is corrupt and it is um, decaying, and God is going to transform it soon. And He's starting with this little group of believers, and the, that little group of believers, that microcosm is going to grow and grow into righteousness. And eventually the whole world will be transformed. Um, you see that kind of language in Romans. We'll, we'll see that when we look at the letter to Romans. All creation is in groaning, waiting in expectation for the uh, redemption of the sons of God. Um, that's, you know, believers. Um, so it's, it's saying that, you know, um, the salvation of believers in the Christian community is the beginning of the transformation of the entire world. So anyway, in our Lord Jesus Christ um, has that kind of cosmological co uh, connotation. Okay. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in the power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. <laughs> just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for our for your sake. So notice, he has chosen you. Chosen is a key way that Jews define themselves, right? They're the chosen people of God. They are the elect, right? Um, God has chosen Israel to be his own people um, so that they can be justified, made holy, sanctified, so that God could kind of display what it means to be truly human, right? Um, what creation was originally intended to be. Um, they can be a light to the nations. So similarly, Paul sees, you know, these Gentile believers as really part of the chosen people. And he's going to want to emphasize that, right? Because they still have that those anxieties, like, are we really part of the chosen people? You know? Um, uh, and he said, he'll say, you are brothers and sisters, right? Um, beloved by God, chosen by you. You know, you have the Holy Spirit, full conviction, not just in word, but in power, right? He's emphasizing to people who are anxious, who are saying, like, I want circumcision, you know, or, or even if they're not complaining about it anymore, like they still are worried about this kind of thing. Um, because, you know, those are the dominant categories by which he thought of um Judaism in the in that time. And he's also trying to prove his own authority, right? Because he wants them to feel secure. You know, you do have the Holy Spirit and the people who have like basically brought you to faith, me, you know, Paul and Sylvanus and Timothy, we also are good people. We do have the Holy Spirit too. So you're going to see that constant kind of trying to self-justify or, um, you know, um, uh, yeah, um, trying to persuade um, the Thessalonians, um, both that they are chosen and that the medi mediators of their salvation are also, you know, sincere, authentic, um, Holy Spirit-driven people. 
Okay, verse 6, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all believers in Macedonia and, Ach and Achaia. So you have a lot of this ex exemplar, example, imitation. Um, that's like kind of how children learn from their parents. That's how um, education um, was often thought, uh, you know, um, it was conceived of as, as like imitation and exemplaric, you know, um, uh, behavior. Okay, hold on, guys. Oh, yeah, I'm going to take a quick break and you can see my kids. Hey, hey turn around this way. Can you turn around? No. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, you don't like it? Okay, but I just want to show the. There they are. Okay, I just want to show you guys real quick. Um, my kids. Hold on. All right. Um, just let me continue here. <clears throat> okay, so they're chosen. They're beloved. Um, they're you know, um, they have learned right they have learned how to truly become virtuous through the holy spirit so that's why you have the emphasis on imitation exemplarity um, and then joy and persecution right we this is another thing we um talked about um in spite of persecution receive the word with joy inspired by the holy spirit so it's a it's it's a, a sign that you really do have the holy spirit Um, let's see, uh, continuing with this passage, the people of those regions report about, about us, what kind of welcome we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God <clears throat> and to wait for his son from heaven, uh, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. Okay. So, um, yeah, what do I have to say about this? Um, I think we're done. Let me move on to the next. We're going to look at chapters one, two, and four, I believe, and then that will that'll be it, I think. Okay, so chapter two. <laughs> There's a few more um verses I've picked and choose here to um illustrate, you know, um the themes that we've talked about already that we see in one Thessalonians. So 1 Thessalonians 2, 2, though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the good news of God in spite of great opposition. Good news. I don't know if I've said this yet, but it's very important. Um, the word gospel is actually a, um, a weird old English translation of the phrase good news, right? So um, whenever uh, Paul talks about his gospel, he's talking about his good news, his version of the good news, which means um, I'll give you a fuller definition at some point because, you know, you'll have to be responsible for this. But um, his good news means basically his account of how Jesus, um, Jesus's offer of the spirit as an unmerited gift that will justify that's good news, right? Because it's good news that you're being saved from God's judgment, his uh, um, impending judgment on the whole world, right? For uh, justice and injustice and so on. So the first thing, right? We, we see that Paul is trying to defend his character. He is, they, uh, and showing his virtue, right? That he has suffered, he has been shamefully mistreated, but he had courage in um, our God to declare to you the good news in spite of great opposition. So this is a sign that Paul um, has authentic authority, right? Um, and it's it's part of this whole trying to encourage the Thess Thessalonians that they um, they themselves are virtuous because they've had good teachers, right? And it also shows that he's not asking them to do anything that he hasn't gone through. So he is very much emphasizing that he himself has been, um, has suffered, has been shamefully mistreated, has been persecuted, 
um, is is constantly being sort of you know um, whipped and and things like that, and you know by um, Jews persecuting him and by all kinds of uh, trials that he's had to go because he travels so much. Really, the amount of traveling he does um, and <clears throat> that we can tell from you know um, visiting all these different communities is uh, it's really extraordinary. Um, travel in the ancient world was not easy and it's very unusual to have people travel this much. Um, this is one of the reasons why Jesus is described as traveling everywhere too. It's, it's, a, it's a sign of you know, the, his sort of desire and virtue to reach everybody, right? Um, and his willingness to, um, to suffer in order to um, help other people become reconciled with God. All right, so to continue, we speak not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. Um, again, showing the this authenticity. Um, we were gentle among you like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. Okay. Um, these are all sort of um, examples of Oh, I'm sorry. Um, examples of um, the uh, ways that teachers would describe themselves um, when they were trying to demonstrate or, or persuade people of their um, sincerity, authenticity, um, and care. Okay, let's see. Um, you remember our labor and toil, brothers and sisters, we work night and day so that we might not burden any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. So again, you know, he's, uh, he's asking them, you know, he's uh, congratulating them for their labor of love, endurance and hope and so on. Um, and he also is doing labor and toil. And um, this is this also reflects the the fact that Paul um, seemed to not ask for any um, um, free food and board um, from the communities that he <clears throat> ministered to, and this was probably quite unusual. He he says in one Corinthians chapter nine that um, I think Peter and James and some of the other apostles. They typically will ask for um, room and board um, taken care of by those that they're ministering to. And he even says that it's a, a command of the Lord. He said that those who uh, labor for the gospel should receive a, their reward. Um, but he decides not to. So that um, I think it's a sign of his uh, sincerity um, in wanting to give good good things right to his gentile recipients and he's he seems very uh very much trying to combat this suspicion that might be around that um against um sophists that's uh teachers of wisdom who um charge money uh philosophers would often you know sort of um denigrate sophists uh for charging money for um, teaching people when they um, would uh, sort of describe themselves as not asking for money. That was in classical philosophy, not in Paul's time. In Paul's time, uh, generally, even philosophers, um, you know, uh, received money for their teaching and so on. But it was part of the rhetoric of antiquity. Um, okay, let's see. What else do I want to see here? You can see toward the end in these passages here, okay? Again, um, he's trying to emphasize that God is at work with them, with with these, um, with the Gentiles, right? He's, um, we also constantly give thanks to God for this, that when you receive the word of God that you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as what it really is, God's word, which is also at work in you believers. And then the last section, for you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. 
for you suffered the same things from your own compatriots as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They displeased God and oppose everyone by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. Now, <clears throat> this is one of those passages where, you know, Paul against Judaism scholars will point to and say, look, Paul didn't like the Jews, right? But this is obviously silly because Paul was a Jew. Um, and what he's saying there, it seems to be more, he's focused, he focused on um, the specific Jews in the area of Judea who um, were part of bringing Jesus um, to um, his execution. Uh, they didn't execute him. They did not kill Jesus, um, contrary to what Paul says here, because um, Jews were not allowed to uh, um, administer capital punishment under the Roman Empire. The Romans could only do that. That's why Pontius Pilate is the one who oversees the execution of Jesus in the Gospels. But, you know, it, it is clear that um, the Jewish leadership in Judea um, had some role in bringing Jesus to death. So, in, it, in any case, the point here is... <laughs> that the Gentiles in Thessalonica, um, they are, Paul is saying that they are suffering the same things as Jewish Christians, um, Jewish followers of Christ suffered um, at the hands of um, the Judeans who persecuted Jesus as well. So the point here is um, to once again persuade or console assuage these um, Gentile Thessalonians um, that they are truly part of the people of God, part, truly part of the chosen people. Okay, and the another, another thing, I, last thing I should add on this passage is that not only is Paul saying that they are equal to the Jews, right? Um, that they're, you know, just as much chosen people as other chosen people, but they're even um, contrasted as superior to the Jews who have who oppose God's salvation of the Gentiles, right? Not just as good as the Jews, but better. Um, but here, I, I would you know I would urge that the central point is not assuming that Paul has an anti-Jewish bias, but the point is the legitimization legitimation of gentile believers okay um yeah okay let me move on now to the next slide chapter four <clears throat> so in every one of paul's letters there's a paranetic section uh, usually toward the end of the letter where paul exhorts them he's built this argument you know um about whatever it is that the um the community is going through you know in galatians it's struggling against the temptation to circumcise um in um, one thessalonians it is you know dealing with the anxiety of not feeling like you're part of the chosen people and um it is you know suffering um persecution at the hands of your compatriots in Thessalonica, and in you know one Corinthians, there's going to be a whole separate thing. But <clears throat> anyway, you'll get through the argument to the, the the body of the letter where where he lays out an argument, and toward the end he'll start exhorting them. It's just basically you know oftentimes just a list of commandments, you know, a list of um, um, exhortations, imperatives, you know. Uh, of what it means to live by the Spirit. So here he is exhorting them to um, holiness and self-control, as he pretty much always does. Um, he is warning them to abstain from sexual immorality and strong desire. Uh, let's see, I'll just read through this a little bit. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication, that each of each one of you know how to control your own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passion like the Gentiles who do, who do not know God. 
that no one wrong or exploit a brother or sister in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, just as we have already told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God did not call us to impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever rejects this rejects not human authority, but God who also gives his Holy Spirit to you. Okay, so clear enough point. Um, in the next passage here, <clears throat> you have um, an echo of Jeremiah 31. Okay. Jeremiah 31, right? God promised that um, he would transform Israel, write his law on their hearts so that no one would have to turn to prophets uh, who say this is the will of God, but they would know God's will interiorly, right? Um, so this idea of being theodidactoi, um, taught by God, you see here in, uh, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 through 12, now concerning love of the brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anyone write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. So you know, it, right? Um, they've been taught by God directly. And the content of the teaching is to love one another, right? Which is uh, one way that Paul kind of sums up the law, right? And so if you had the law of God written in your hearts, God has taught you this, you don't have to ask other people, Um um th this is what you know paul is suggesting that the thessalonians have fulfilled this prophecy okay uh so he says right they have the the jesus's understanding of the law of god right love one another um and then if you continue in this passage <clears throat> what's kind of surprising is it, it seems like the, the lines that follow what I just read basically define what it means to love one another, okay? You yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, and indeed you do love all the brothers and sisters throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, beloved, to do so more and more, right? To aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we directed you so that you may behave properly towards outsiders and be dependent on no one. <laughs> now, it's possible that um, to aspire to live quietly, mind your own affairs, work with your hands, etc., cetera, is um, a definition of what it means to do more so, uh, to do so more and more, to continue to love one another. So that, that could be, Paul's way of defining what concretely it means to love one another in Thessalonica. Um, and, you know, in all of his letters, he'll basically sum up the law as love one another. And um, but he will often for each community kind of define what it means to love one another in different ways, <clears throat> depending on the context. Right. So it's sort of a situational ethics in some sense or circumstantial um, ethics. Um, or it's possible that, you know, he, he, he means to do so more and more, <clears throat> but we urge you beloved to do so more and more, let's continue to love one another. And then when he goes on to aspire, to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, work with your own hands, those are additional things, you know, different things, not necessarily loving one another, but other things that they should do in any case. <clears throat> um, I, I wanted to just, you know, bring it back to that point that I made earlier, um, that passages like this that have Paul advising the Thessalonians to um, live quietly, kind of keep their heads down, don't rock the boat, mind your own affairs. Um, you know, you, you should probably think about that in the context of their persecution. So he's basically saying, don't respond to persecution with, you know, um, um, by like, you know, trying to take people to court or um, or taking vengeance or, you know, on on other people. Um, <clears throat> just kind of keep your heads down and and try to respond in a, you know, nonviolent, um, forgiving way and to work with your hands so that you may behave properly towards outsiders and be dependent on no one. So it seems like, you know, 
if you if you um, think about the Thessalonian community as generally lower class people, um, probably not in abject poverty, but um, they're probably sort of blue collar, I guess you could call them manual laborers. They had to work day and night to afford to live in a city center like Thessalonica. These are people who don't have the money or social standing to take their persecutors to court um, because in the Roman legal system, the poor are almost always lost in court. So Paul's recommending that they just, you know, um, kind of don't engage, right? Um, he also is encouraging the Thessalonians to admonish the idlers, which again, probably reflects that poverty of some of um, the members of the community. It um, ex probably also explains why Paul emphasized that he worked to support his own financial needs while he's there with them in Thessalonica, right? I've probably mentioned this before, but Paul um, is described as being a tent maker, um, which is really dirty, really disgustingly smelly. Uh, manual labor because you know you soak leather and in, in urine and and um, excrement and stuff like that. <laughs> um. So um. Yeah. Okay. So one thing that we will talk about um toward the end of the semester when we read the the book of Revelation. Revelation, um, there are hints in Revelation that it was written, um, a lot of it was written um, after the persecution of the early Christians in um, 64 by Nero, the Emperor Nero. Um, we have historical evidence that the Emperor Nero blamed this fire that occurred in Rome on um, Christians. Probably because they were, you know, um, it probably... Um, you know, every, pre people pretty much assumed that this was a false accusation and that they were an easy scapegoat because Christians were illegal. Um, like Jews, they were not typically participating in pagan sacrificial cults. Therefore, people would often assume that bad things happened because they weren't praising the gods. Um, <clears throat> and um, so anyway... The letter to uh, uh, the book of Revelation um, will call Nero, for example, the beast. He'll, they'll call Emperor Nero the beast um, in coded terms. They, they refer to the number of the beast as 666. And if you decode 666 um, according to um, the way that Hebrew characters, each Hebrew character, is con you can convert it into a number. Um, the, uh, the name, um, was it? Kaiser Neron or something like that, I think is how it's um, worked out. <laughs> Kaiser Neron um, equals 666, uh, 666 in, um, in uh, their numerology. So um, the book of Revelation clearly has a big issue with uh, the Roman Empire. Um, they uh there's a strong condemnation um they describe uh rome as this sort of um prostitute seated on a beast you know drinking the blood of the martyrs it's just really gory really dark scene in revelation chapter 18 but um the beginning of the book of revelation it's quite possible um and we'll read um an, an article <clears throat> I think maybe only if you do the oral exam, you'll read this article um, that uh, makes this argument uh, that the book of Revelation was um, in the beginning, the first few chapters. It targets like several churches in the area of sort of um, Thessalonica and other places, Ephesus and things like that. Um, and these are precisely the places where Pauline churches were. And um is some of the criticisms of those churches in the book of Revelation are for things like um, eating meat sacrificed to um, pagan idols, which we'll see in 1 Corinthians. Paul actually says it's okay to do that, even though he he kind of recommends not to do that. Um, and um, things like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite possible that 
the book of Revelation took issue with um, Paul's assimilationist attitude toward Rome. Rome, you know, it's very unusual for an apocalyptic Jew to not say Rome is the enemy, right? But it seems like that's um, that's very much how Paul understood. Um, that's the kind of apocalyptic Jew that Paul was. He saw the fight not as against Rome, but against sin. Um, and he very much distinguishes those two. And he very much encourages early Christians to not try to take the fight to Rome, um, probably because they were poor and weak and, um, um, and you know, they, they he um and and he didn't want them you know um getting executed for their um for their faith probably whereas the book of revelation will say it's precisely the martyrs that are the heroes and it seems to criticize the Pauline communities and really makes the the enemy to be the empire the roman empire in particular um, but a lot of this is probably because the book of Revelation is writing after 64 when um, Nero did persecute Christians and Paul is writing in 50 where, you know, there is no official kind of war, uh, you know, with Christianity at the time. Even after 64, there wasn't a war with Christianity. It's only till like really the 250s CE where you get major uh, Roman imperial kind of like seeking out Christians and 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 putting them to death kind of thing um anyway we'll talk about that another time um okay the final thing that i want to talk about here is this passage yeah this is the last one okay uh, i'll just read this and then we'll talk about it um this is chapter 4 verses 13 to 18 but we do not want you to be uninformed brothers and sisters about those who have died so that you may not grieve as others do not do who who have no hope for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again even so through Jesus God will bring with him those who have died for this we declare to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive who are left until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who have died for the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Okay. Um, so this passage was um, very often in the past um, seen as kind of proof that <clears throat> this letter in general, the purpose of it was to um, to comfort a community who believed that Paul, um, because Paul um, told them this, um, that the end would come soon before anyone died, okay? Um, and people still say this all the time, that this is the reason you know, 1 Thessalonians was written, and um, and they'll point to 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, 13 to 18, as proof that this is something that Paul taught, that people, that the end would come soon before anybody died. Um, now, this is one of the issues. There's another issue in this in passage. We'll talk about it. The idea of getting caught up in the air, we'll talk yeah, uh, we'll talk about that in a, in a second. Um, so um, people ge generally scholarship, it, it, it's kind of um, it's uh, there's there's no strong kind of majority position. You know, it, this is very much a debated passage. Uh, I don't think that um, this is necessarily about uh, failure to trust in the coming resurrection because people have started dying in the community. Um, um, I think it's more Paul telling the Thessalonians that they should be people of joy who trust in the resurrection and show that to outsiders so that, um, so that they shouldn't, particularly the women, practice traditional mourning practices when their loved one dies, okay? 
So it, a lot of this depends on how you translate that first verse, right? But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died so that you may not you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. So is the, the question about, um, you know, their, their failure of, of trust or of their lack of faith, or is it um, the problem of mourning? Um, so we'll see throughout his letters, there's this very consistent thing where Paul um, thinks that um, believers need to, their emotions need to be transformed in line with their beliefs. Okay. And this is very, this is very much um, a standard way of thinking in Greco Roman philosophy. That <clears throat> one way of thinking about how the, the mind um, comes to kind of rule the body is to think that um not only should you know you kind of choose reason over you know the passions like for example you know if somebody's like addicted to gambling right like just make the decision like okay that's bad for me um i i shouldn't get sucked into this it's always going to be a losing proposition I need to just stop gambling, you know, or alcohol or whatever, you know, like, um, you know, the, the um, just kind of forcing yourself to stop. I know that that's not how, you know, that's not how um, um, it really works. You know, it's, it's obviously nobody just, well, some people like can maybe stop smoking or something like that if they have a good enough motivation to do it. But, um, in any case, um, the, it's not just, you know, sort of, um, reason, um, over the body, um, over, uh, reason telling your body to act in certain ways, but reason in the philosophical tradition, um, primarily works on the emotions. So <clears throat> if you, if you think that, for example, reason and virtue um, are the best things in the world, right? Um, and the philosophers often argue this. You should therefore work on your emotional attachment to money, to the desire for fame and glory and honor um, or power over people. And they would often um kind of they 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 would call it mental training you know they 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 would have these exercises the word um asceticism comes from the greek word eschesis which means training or exercise and originally asceticism you know wasn't so much just like not drinking alcohol or not eating too much food but it was <clears throat> these kind of mental exercises whereby you kind of you argue against your emotions that you want to get rid of. So for example, you want to get rid of the fear of death. You will imagine your death and you will argue, well, death is nothing to be afraid of. For example, this is how the Epicureans argued it. They would say, you know, before we came into the world, we had no consciousness. And after we go out of the world, we're not going to have any consciousness. So there's no pain if you have no consciousness. Um, therefore death is nothing to be afraid of, right? We, you know, there's, there's nothing, um, that we know about it. So, um, we shouldn't, we shouldn't fear it. This is, these were, you know, and the, the goal of philosophers were to transform their emotions in line with their values and their beliefs, right? <clears throat> and they wanted to, um, the, the emotions, transformation of the emotions was like a, a central part of the philosophical life. So Paul conceives of the Christian life similarly, that um, if you're truly Christian, um, you will recognize that knowing Christ is the only true good and that everything else is rubbish. This is how he describes it in the third chapter to the Philippians. <laughs> 
and um, therefore you should you should change transform your emotional attachment to all different things. We'll see this when we get to one Corinthians. He does a similar thing. He says basically, you know, people that are married should be like people that are not married. People who own possessions or houses should be like people who don't possess anything. Um, you should basically treat everything with emotional dis detachment, right? You should not use things for your own good, your own self-satisfaction, but you should sort of use them in a rational way, as, you know, for the the um the glory of god's kingdom right you should put your goods at the disposal of justice of the community the needs of the community or <clears throat> whatever glorifies god in that in, in that in whatever context you're in so in, this is one reason why i think you know this passage is really about not grieving um because it was is traditional for women to be the ones who mourned um people who died and it seems like paul is telling the thessalonian women um don't be like those pagan women who go out and mourn when people die and things like that he's, he's saying um you know it's it's sending the wrong signal to the um, other gentiles the non-believing gentiles um about your your commitments you know not grieving shows people that you um you truly have been transformed, that you know um, God's goodness. You know and you're certain of his hope because you have this Holy Spirit within you. Um, so he wants them to kind of be witnesses, right, to the power of the Holy Spirit to transform, transform you here. Okay, so let's see. Um, yeah okay let's see all right um yeah and then there's this whole thing some people will read this as the rapture okay you know i'm not even going to get into the rapture it's gonna it's a whole nother thing we'll talk about it when we get to the book of revelation um you know just long story short um uh, there is no rapture going on in this passage um this is what this is talking about is basically why do they why why are why are the dead rising um, at the sound of the trumpet? Because Paul thinks of the resurrection of the body as a transformation into basically a celestial stuff. Um, this is implied in Daniel chapter 12, where it says that the righteous will become like the stars in the sky. Uh, and um, in Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, we'll see, he says that you know, there's earthly stuff and there's celestial stuff. And um, the bodies of those who are resurrected by God will be celestial stuff. And celestial stuff belongs in the sky, right? It's like by nature, you know, certain things kind of float in the water. So that's how he's thinking about it. Celestial stuff by nature goes up. So it sounds crazy, but um, Paul does seem to think that the believers um, at the eschaton, when um, Jesus returns to um, bring an end to the sort of all opponents of God and transforms creation for good, um, believers will be the first. They will be transformed bodily and they will rise up into the sky um, to be with God forever. Um, so this is not what some people will call the rapture, the separation of righteous um, from wicked um, so that the wicked can be punished on earth. Um, this is the this is the bodily resurrection. This is the end um, of that sort of eschatological timeline. Okay, um, great. Thank you for listening to me and um, hopefully I will see you on Wednesday. Thanks.